This lesson is all about non-traditional resonance. And in this video, I wanted to start us out by reviewing a little bit about what traditional resonance is, how we can recognize it within molecules, and recognize when it's important. In other words, when resonance structures are actually reasonable to propose as potential alternative Lewis structures for a particular molecule. By the end of this video, you should have a pretty good grasp of traditional resonance and of the factors that go into making resonance structures important in general. We'll add on to the framework of what I call traditional resonance in the following videos when we add the sigma source and the sigma star sink to our list of possible bonds that can participate in resonance. This is non-traditional because you often hear people say that resonance structures involve only lone pairs, pi bonds, and carbocations, which restricts us to using in a pi and pi star orbitals in resonance. But in fact, a deeper and more nuanced and more general picture of resonance takes all the electron sources and sinks into account. So ultimately, looking long term, what we're going to build is a generalized picture of resonance that involves all of the sources and sinks that we've looked at in previous lessons. I wanted to start us off with a little bit of motivation for studying resonance. What is resonance good for? What does it show us? Well, there are two big ideas here that we'll talk about in detail a little bit later in this video. The first is resonance stabilization. Resonance is a key factor that allows us to think about the stability of two charged molecules. For example, we might compare the tert butyl cation with an allyl cation that's tertiary. Resonance in the tertiary allyl cation reveals that this molecule on the right, that I'm enclosing in brackets, is more stable than the one on the left. And that's due to resonance stabilization. We'll look at another example of this shortly. The second big idea is hidden structural features. The fact is that the Lewis formalism is limited because it shows us a snapshot of the electrons in a molecule when in fact we know that not only are electrons moving rapidly in molecules, but their positions are probabilistic. And so saying that a lone pair is located at a particular point in space, for example, by drawing a lone pair in this fashion, is simplifying the picture enormously in all molecules, and for some it's more important than others. For example, in the enolate anion, we draw a Lewis structure of that, say with three lone pairs on oxygen, and this is just a snapshot of the electronic positions. Because of that, it doesn't really reflect reality. Resonance structures show us that the electrons are actually delocalized in the pi system of the enolate, and the negative charge is not localized on the oxygen atom, but is shared with the carbon atom on the other end of the pi system. Before we dive into these two big uses and purposes for resonance in more detail, I wanted to do a quick review of traditional resonance. One of the things we would like to do is identify a general procedure for recognizing when resonance is important within a molecule. And when it comes to traditional resonance, this is easy to do when we notice that traditional resonance involves a limited number of sources and a limited number of sinks. So the two sources are the non-bonding lone pair, which I'll just represent here as X, and the pi bond, which I'll just represent here as a generic carbon-carbon pi bond. And I'm going to draw each of these sources twice for a reason that you'll see here in a second. The two sinks are the empty atomic orbital and the pi star orbital. The empty atomic orbital we typically associate with the carbocation. I'll just tack that on to each of these sources. And the pi star orbital we find just as a pi bond. It could be a CC pi bond or more commonly a CO or carbon nitrogen pi bond. And these four structures right here represent all of the structures associated with traditional resonance that we find. So these building blocks of traditional resonance, when we recognize them in Lewis structures, we know right away that resonance is important. And we can actually extend these structures out longer. So for instance, I could tack on an additional pi bond, and not only is traditional resonance important in this molecule, but it's even more important, and there are even more resonance structures 
in this molecule as compared to the one lacking that extra pi bond. So just to give you an idea of the curved arrows here, we can see electron flow like this. And I would challenge you to draw pictures of the interacting molecular orbitals in each of these four cases. The overlap here is in a pi type fashion and notice that all of these represent pi systems of some length of two atoms or greater. So this is an interesting thing to notice about traditional resonance. It's a way to identify extended pi systems in molecules as well. So let's explore this idea of resonance stabilization in a little more detail. The core principle here is that molecules with delocalized charges are more stable than comparable molecules with localized charges. To give you a sense of this general idea, a bare lone pair on an isolated atom is going to be less stable than a molecule whose negative charge is spread out over multiple atoms via resonance. So in this sort of generalized example, we see that the negative charge is actually spread out over multiple atoms. Because of the delocalization of charge, the molecule at the bottom here is more stable than the top one, which lacks resonance completely. A second important application of all resonance is hidden reactivity. Resonance reveals hidden partial charges in molecules. We've seen an example of this already with the allyl cation, but I'll just give you one more example involving an electron sink associated with this molecule. This molecule has a nice pi to pi star resonance structure that looks like this. And what this resonance structure reveals is that the carbon on the end of the pi system is a good electron sink. Without recognizing the resonance, it would have been difficult for us to pinpoint this carbon as a potential electrophile. In fact, these curved arrows really reveal clearly that that atom is one of the best, if not the best, electrophiles in this molecule. So resonance reveals hidden partial charges, and in fact, a calculation of the molecular orbitals of this molecule would reveal that the largest partial positive charge is actually located on this carbon atom. Resonance helps us see that. Here's another example of this. In the treatment of butadiene with hydrobromic acid, which you see right here, one of the possible products is provided for you here. This goes essentially by a mechanism involving protonation of the double bond first. Either of the double bonds will work, and in either case, we'll arrive at a cation that looks like this. If the cation is directly attacked by bromide anion, we end up with the product that you see right here. But there's an alternative resonance structure for this cation that looks like this. And if the bromide attacks at that position, we end up with an entirely different product. One that has the bromine on the far end of the pi system and a double bond in the middle here. So the second possible product, we could only see that if we recognize the resonance in this cationic intermediate right here. What about a hidden electron source? Well, a classic example of traditional resonance's role in revealing a hidden electron source is in electrophilic aromatic substitution, or EAS, reactions. So you're seeing one example of that here. That's the treatment of anisole, this molecule, this aromatic molecule on the left here, with acetyl chloride and aluminum trichloride. These are very electrophilic reaction conditions that you see right here. And so the ring is acting as a nucleophile or electron source under these conditions. A curious observation is that the ortho and para positions of the aromatic ring react in preference to the meta position, which does not react at all under these conditions. And the question is why? Resonance can point us to the hidden electron sources in this molecule. We can see that methoxy group as a good electron donor. And by recognizing that a lone pair is next to a pi system, in this structure, we can see n to pi star resonance. So this is one possibility for the resonance, and that would reveal a hidden electron source at the ortho position of the aromatic ring. But in fact, we can keep going with the electron flow, pushing down and over to the para position. And when we do that, that reveals that there's partial negative charge on the para position as well.
Hopefully this introduction to traditional resonance theory reminded you of three important facts. The first is that traditional resonance is structurally limited to lone pairs, pi bonds, and carbocations typically, because these are the structural elements that can overlap in a pi type fashion, and they're on the frontier of electronic occupation typically, so they're your best sources and sinks. The second principle is the idea of resonance stabilization, the idea that the delocalization of charge and the spreading out of electrons that comes with resonance is a stabilizing factor in both charged and in some cases uncharged molecules. And the third idea is the notion that resonance reveals hidden partial charges, hidden reactivity, and other hidden structural features that we wouldn't be able to see simply by looking at a single static resonance form.